Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you all. It's a highlight of Leslie and my week to get to come up here and worship with you in the mornings, get to hear how your week has been, um, get to think like what happened to our week? How was our week even? I don't even remember it. Um, but wow, to hear the testimonies already this morning of what the Lord's done for, for you all up here in this area with uh, the weather and the various individual challenges uh, that that has introduced, but also the, the victories that the Lord has given you. And the testimonies for that encourages me. Amen. So, this week, we're going to celebrate. Amen. What do we celebrate this week in this nation? Independence Day. Independence Day is on Wednesday. It doesn't make it convenient for those who like to uh, celebrate on the weekends and have a three-day weekend or a four-day weekend. But I'm going to try to get these shifted around one-handed here. So we celebrate our independence this week, and we are not obliged to speak about that this morning. But there's great opportunity in getting to reflect on what it is um, what it is that has founded this nation and the freedoms and liberties we get to enjoy because of that. And this place, this meeting, like this today, is one of those things. So I'm, I'm thankful and I'm grateful for that and I don't let that go um, without, without recognizing that. But also, if I may, um, I'd like to stick with that theme this morning Amen. with freedom and liberty. And I want to ask you, have you considered freedom and liberty? And are they the same thing? Are they different? Are there, is, is there something to be learned from looking at freedom and liberty closer? So when I thought, well, freedom, liberty, we use those words almost interchangeably. And so this morning, I know it's been a tough week. And there's, there's things that our heart are, is heavy on, about, um, and there's weariness of our mind and our body. Um, but I'd like to take us through, if you don't mind this morning, um, a little bit of teaching on freedom and liberty and how that can energize us and put some motivation and some spring back into our step and rejuvenate us and give us life because freedom and liberty <laughs> What are they worth if, if we don't have the life to live, um, live in those things? So let's spend some time looking at both the words freedom and liberty and see what um, a dictionary definition has to teach us about freedom and liberty. Freedom is defined in many different ways and has very many different line items in the dictionary on how it's defined. But we'll go through a few here. Freedom is the power to determine action without restraint. Freedom is the absence of release from ties or obligations. Freedom is exemption from external control, interference or regulation, or exemption from the presence of anything specified, really. So freedom from something, freedom from, for example, fear. But liberty, liberty is defined a little bit differently, and it's always defined in the context of freedom, as if, it's a, as if they're relative terms. Liberty is freedom from external or foreign rule, independence. It's what we're celebrating this week. Freedom from control, interference, obligation, restriction, hampering conditions, or it's the power or right of doing, thinking, speaking. Two more here. Freedom, is, liberty is freedom from captivity, confinement, or physical restraint. And lastly, liberty is freedom or right to frequent or use a place. We have the right to assembly as American citizens, right? That is our freedom. And we can assemble even in this place this morning. We need to recognize that and remember that and be thankful for that. So with those, with those dictionary definitions, what can we learn and see from those things? They sound very much the same. I could use them interchangeably, and we almost do. Um, but freedom comes from a Saxon root and from a German word, whereas liberty has a Normanic root from a French word. 
And so we have two different languages, two different roots, but we use them in English and they mean the same thing in different cultures, in different contexts. So if you're speaking in German, you need a word for liberty, right? So you say freedom. Or you're in French and you need a word for freedom, so you say liberty. But how do we as, as Americans now use those words? And we can look back in history a little bit and see kind of how those words have historical context for us and if there are any differences between them that we as a culture have have ascribed to them because communication is a tool right and it's a tool that's constantly adapting that we're adapting to best fit our needs and when we look at freedom and liberty the thing I want to point out that's most simple to me to understand is freedom is always in reference to being freedom free from something so free from Freedom is free from, but what are we free to? And that is liberty. Liberty is what we are free to. Amen. Freedom, free from. Free to is liberty. So freedom from, liberty to. And Thomas Jefferson, I'll speak, um, I'll speak about him for, uh, for a few minutes here briefly. And we'll look at his understanding of the terms freedom and liberty to help give us to paint a picture for us on, on the context there. I'm quoting Thomas Jefferson from 1793, and he's talking about the freedom of the press. He says, considering the great importance to the public liberty of the freedom of the press and the difficulty of submitting to it very precise rules, the laws have thought it less mischievous to give greater scope to its freedom than to the restraint of it. So what we see is having a press, having a voice to, and, a, and a mechanism to exchange thoughts or ideas, having a press is a liberty. But is there freedom of the press? And that's what he was talking about. And he says that any restriction on the press, in his opinion, is a mischief. So he thinks it's less mischievous to only restrict the freedom of the press narrowly. And it's not just any liberty, it's a public liberty. It's a liberty shared by all of us, the press. So I'm trying to help us understand the nuances between what freedom is and what liberty is. We have a public liberty to a press, to a press that is free from restraints, he says. It's less mischievous to give greater scope to its freedom than to the restraint of it. When we speak of inerrant and inalienable rights, we're talking about things that allow us as people, God-given, commonly recognized rights, as things that allow us as people to live to our fullest potential. So life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are those rights that we are aware, that we uh, keep in the front of our mind from our constitutional documents. But what does Thomas Jefferson have to say about the right of liberty? He says, rightful liberty is unobstructed action according to our will within limits drawn around us by the equal rights of others. And that's different than what freedom is. Freedom describes something that is without restraint. It's in reference to what could be bound, but we're free from that. Liberty, however, he says, rightful liberty <coughs> is within limits. It's looking at what we are free to do. And when you think about it, okay, if my liberty, if I have liberty to something, it's implied then I don't have liberty to something else, right? If there are specific liberties, then there are specific things I cannot also do. Freedom doesn't reference those things. Freedom only references what we are have been released from released from ties or obligations or constraints, liberty is looking at what we are free then to do within limits, as Thomas Jefferson puts it. I'll read it again. Rightful liberty is unobstructed action according to our will within limits drawn around us by the equal rights of others. And he recognized by quoting in 1790 that all natural rights may be abridged or modified in their exercise by law. But 23 years later, he says that laws abridging those natural rights should be, should be restrained by rigorous constrictions within the narrowest limits. 
So he and I uh, agree here that the laws restricting rights ought to be few and far between, but they exist. We need to recognize that our liberty has limits, and that's how, that's how our society, that is how Americans and the English language uses the terms liberty and uses the terms freedom. So before we just take Thomas Jefferson's word for it, do we understand a little bit about Thomas Jefferson? What do you know of Thomas Jefferson? He was, yeah, he was a founding father, our third president. I saw the number three thrown out there. That's excellent. Exactly right. And he was born April 13th, 1743. That makes him 33 in 1776. Just for some reference there, he was 33 in 1776. And he died 50 years later, 83 years old, in 1826 on July 4th. Is anyone familiar with Thomas Jefferson's beliefs, though? Thomas Jefferson was an imperialist. And, and sorry, an empiricist. He, he put more stock in observation in science and using his experiences to trump miracles and to trump the supernatural and to trump spirituality. So while he had a Bible, he had all the miracles actually physically cut out and removed from his Bible. So he understood the scripture to himself being a good ethical teaching, but not a good moral uh, a good moral teaching. He thought it was self-serving to Christ and Christ's followers. Um, so he did not recognize the deity of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, his divinity, or atonement at all. So Thomas Jefferson, while he may have had a, had a good operational understanding of freedom and liberty with respect to society and the times they were living in, he did not recognize Christ as his savior. He did not recognize the supernatural. So I wanted to spend most of the morning looking at what the scripture has to say about freedom and liberty and what impact that has on our life. Because as we consider freedom as being set free from something and now having liberty, liberty to something else, how does that influence our lives and what can we do with that? There's several different passages I'll be going to, but um, I want to start with just one-off verses, just to kind of show us it, the show us the concept of freedom shown in the Scripture. Genesis 2 verse 16 says, "The Lord God commanded the man, saying, "Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat." So you see the concept of freedom in there, in that they could eat of any tree of the garden whenever they liked, how, however much of it they wanted to eat, they were free. But their liberty only extended so far. The limits on that was except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Amen. So they were f able to freely eat of the trees that they were allowed to eat from. Their liberty had constraints and limitations. In Deuteronomy 24, verse 5, it says, When a man hath taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war, neither shall he be charged with any business, but he shall be free at home one year, and shall cheer up his wife, which he hath taken. Amen. How amazing is that? Do we need that back? We need that back. <laughs> so back to the dictionary definitions of freedom, you see the absence of or release from ties and obligation to the military that first year, right? So he's free from those obligations and that tie. And he has liberty now. But liberty to what? Liberty to go fishing every weekend? <laughs> and leave his wife at home? No, there's limitations. His liberty extends to what? Amen. How exciting is that? So you, so you understand, you're beginning to understand and see the distinction between freedom and liberty. Freedom is free from, liberty is free to. Free to. Luke 13, 12. 
There was a hunchback woman who had an infirmity 18 years. She was stooped over for 18 years. This, this was a great burden. And, and you can imagine, I think maybe we even discussed it here, that being stooped over, looking at the ground for 18 years, can you imagine not being able to look up and see that rainbow that we were discussing? Stooped over for 18 years. And what did Jesus say when he saw her? He called her to him and said to her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. She's freed, freed from bondage or restraint, right? So then what is she at liberty to do? And immediately she stood up and glorified God. Amen. Could she have stayed down? She could have, there was, but there was nothing keeping her anymore from standing erect and glorifying God because of it. Amen. Let's spend more time, though, in John chapter 8. John chapter 8 and verse 31. John 8, 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? So they had a good understanding of what freedom is. Freedom in relation to bondage, right? They said, well, we're not in bondage. So what do we need to be made free from? Recall that? You recognizing that free from? We be Abraham's seed, not in bondage to any man. How do you say you shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Amen. Free from what? Free from sin. Amen. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. It's freedom from the curse of sin, the bondage of sin. They didn't recognize that in their life. They said, we're not in bondage. We're the, we're the children of Abraham. What do we need to be set free from? They did not recognize that they were bound to sin. So if we want to look further and dive in more into being a slave to sin and being set free from sin, you know I'm going to flip over to what chapter here? Romans. I'm going to Romans. Exactly right. Romans chapter 6. And we're going to spend the majority of our time this morning in Romans 6. I'll begin for context in, in chapter 5, verse 20. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. That verse 21, he's going to spend the whole entire next chapter unpacking. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? <clears throat> when I was younger, less understanding, I read Romans 6, 1 to mean, and, and rightly so, that, that I just don't have free license to sin because of grace. Well, grace is going to take care of that. Oh, I'm facing this temptation. I might as well give in. Grace is going to take care of that. That's not, what, that's not what this is saying, nor is it the emphasis of the verse. The verse is saying, grace is a great thing. Grace is, grace is wonderful. So, so how do we make grace more prolific? More of a good thing is a good thing, so let's sin as much as we can so that there's more and more grace. <laughs> and I didn't realize that's, how the, that's where the, uh, the perspective um, of the writer was when he was writing that. 
And he's saying, God forbid. Not at all. Way off. Way off track. That's not, um, that's not accurate to continue to sin so that we um, have more grace. Instead, he says, How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Sin, for those who are, who are dead to it, does not have any hold on us anymore. Amen. But, but those individuals back in the book of John, they didn't recognize that sin was a problem for them. They didn't recognize that they were in bondage to that sin. A chapter back here in Romans 5, it says in verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And then he continues in verse 15, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. What he's saying is, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. The punishment is not commensurate to the crime. He's saying we're not getting what we deserved. The offense and the free gift are two different things. The contrast here is that many by the offense be dead, but much more by the grace of God and the gift by the grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, it's abounded to many. Continuing, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. And he articulates it and, and makes it more concise in 2 Corinthians Second Corinthians 3, I believe. If I, let me lay this mic down here. Or, or I'm just going to summarize it. For as by one man we all die, even by one man we are all made alive. Amen. Right? For as Christ, being that one man, he makes us alive again. So there is this sin issue that was not identified that's clearly called out by the Lord in, in John saying, you're the servants of sin. Who the Son makes free shall be free indeed. And Paul's expounding on that in Romans 6 here. Continuing on from verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Amen. Christ's death frees us from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Dominion, that word is subjective, right? There is oppression under dominion. Death has no more dominion over Christ. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. He is, he is free from the power of death. Amen. That's who our Christ is. Amen. Our Christ Amen. is not restrained Amen. by death. Our Christ is not even, he's not even bound by sin. He is above and beyond sin. He has offered us freedom from sin as well. As he says in verse 11, as we continue, 
Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. So you may have heard some emphasis through those last couple verses, and I want us to pick our brains, if you wouldn't mind shouting out to me, what terms or words in those last three verses, verses 12 through 14, have to do with the opposite of freedom? So reference your Bible, reference the screen. What terms or, or words convey an idea that's opposite of freedom in verses 12 through 14? Dominion. Dominion. Slavery. Yes. Law. Yes. Servants. Servants. Let not sin therefore reign. If something is reigning, it's ruling. Right? Yeah. Where's the freedom in that? Obey. Obey. Yield. Mm -hmm. If we're yielding ourselves to something, we're not free from that, are we? Wow. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. So, I mentioned that verse 21 of chapter 5 was just going to be unpacked for us through the whole, um, through the whole chapter 6. And what Paul is doing here is he's laying a foundation as he's driving home a point towards the end that I'm really excited to get to. And what we did this morning here was we looked at the definition of the terms freedom and liberty, we looked at historical context of freedom and liberty, and we looked at how freedom and liberty are used in the scripture. And we begin to see a clearer, clear, see more clearly the difference, the distinction between what freedom is and what liberty is. Freedom being free from and liberty being something, liberty to, free, we're free to. So keep that in mind as Paul is building this case and laying this foundation for what he's, what he's uh, going to conclude with. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Verse 16, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Uh, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. I thought we were free. free. I thought we're free. What does free mean? What's a correct understanding of being free? It sounds like I'm not maybe as free as I thought or as free as we might be led to believe. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. We're talking a lot about yielding and being a servant and obeying in light of freedom. And where is he going with this? He's going to thank the Lord, verse 17, but God be thanked that though ye were the servants of sin, before, but now ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Amen. He's pointing out that we are servants either way. We can be free from something and have liberty too, but we're a servant either way. Thomas Jefferson recall, recognized that our liberties will always have limitations. Our liberties will always have limitations. If we recall in Matthew 6, we don't have to turn there, but in Matthew 6 it has the Our Father and how we ought to pray and then also goes further to explain that we should pray from a humble perspective, not looking to receive glory 
and being proud, right, in the sight of others. Don't stand out publicly to bring glory to yourself when you pray, but have an attitude and a heart of humility in prayer. So if we say we don't have any masters, if we say we are free, are we truly free? We, when we pray and are proud, who are we serving in that, in that sense? Ourselves. We're going to be serving a master either way. And if it's serving ourselves, we're serving, we're serving the old man. We're serving the man who has been dead to sin who, and who's made free. Further in Matthew 6, it goes on to talk about two masters. And it says, you'll either love one or hate the other, or you'll hate the one and love the other. You can't serve two. He doesn't give us a third option. He doesn't say, you can hate the one and hate the other, and serve nobody. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's, it's reminding us again of liberty, that there's constraints on liberty, that we have to serve one master. We can choose A or B, but not neither. Verse 18 in Romans 6 says, Being made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. So what is the value of our liberty then in Christ? If we're still a servant, if we're not free to do whatever we choose and please, where's the value then in our liberty? He goes on to explain, and he says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. So he's saying, I need to, I need to explain this in terms that you can understand. And I tell you what, having to explain freedom and liberty took me quite a while to understand for myself. And then having 30 minutes here this morning to outline the difference between freedom and liberty is tough to unpack the, the minute detail and the small difference between the two. And he says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, and I'm going to use examples that you understand. I'm going to use examples you can relate to. You know how you've yielded your members, servants to uncleanness in the past. Now, yield your members, servants to righteousness, unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things, whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's what I wanted to get to. You're thinking verse 23, but I mean verse 20. Verse 20 is what I wanted to get to. He had to build a case. He had to lay down the logic for us, for, to understand, for us to understand and understand the impact of Romans 6, verse 20. Did you realize that you were free from righteousness? Come on. Freedom, is freedom a good thing? It's generally recognized as a good thing. We need to understand the context of our freedom, the constraints of our liberty. We were free from righteousness. Not only were we unable to be righteous when we were bound by sin, we were expected to be unrighteous. We were required to be unrighteous, being bound by sin. That was our constraint. We were bound by sin. We were free from righteousness. No power to be righteous. For when you were the servant of sin, you were free from righteousness. So he's asking, he said, I'm going to explain this clearly. I'm going to explain it simply. I'm going to ask you to reflect how you were bound by sin. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? He's asking us to recall being bound by sin and the fruit it produced in our life, the value. 
We're in, a, we're in an ag community, right? We need to produce something in order to increase value. What was the, our life like before Christ? What is our life without Christ and being bound by sin? What value were we producing? What fruit had you then in those things, whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. I'll tell you what fruit that was. It was poisonous fruit. The end thereof was death. Those, those poisonous fruit, we're now ashamed of that. Have you recognized poisonous fruit in your life? Have you recognized that you're free from that? We're free from the old man. It's, been, it's dead. It's been buried and with baptism unto death. But like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Verse 22, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end, everlasting life. Amen. He's pointing out that our fruit now is life. It's no longer poison to us. It's no longer killing us. What we're producing is no longer... At, is no longer binding us and killing us as we produce it. We now have fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Fruit unto holiness. That is liberty. That is the liberty that we have been released from the bondage of sin to then pr pr produce. Produce that fruit. And he's been dropping that hint all the way through this chapter. Verse 18, he said, "...you became the servants of righteousness." Verse 16, he says, You have obedience now unto righteousness. Verse 13, I keep backing up. Yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. This is not an option. This is not optional for us. We have been freed from sin for a very specific reason. We have liberty now to righteousness, unto holiness. Amen. That is the purpose of our freedom. That is the purpose of being freed from sin. It's not so that we can then do whatever we want. It's not, that is not true freedom. We're always looking for, and people know this, and you recognize it in children who are unruly even, we're always looking for bearing in our life, right? Bucking the system and being rebellious, you're always trying to find the bearing in your life. And that is, that is what liberty provides us. Liberty that has limitations provides bearing for us. We have liberty not to consume it on ourselves, the lust of our flesh. Like we were talking about a couple weeks, the last two weeks, we ask, but we ask amiss so that we can consume it on our lusts. That's not what our liberty, that's not the value of our liberty. The value of our liberty is righteousness unto holiness. And the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He says later in chapter 8 and verse 1 and 2, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. So, the emphasis this morning is our liberty in light of the freedom we have. Paul mentions various other things. He's mentioning the, the baptism into death and being dead and alive. He's also bringing up the law in Romans 8. But our emphasis this morning is freedom and liberty. Freedom and liberty in light of those things. And I want us to understand that as he's writing, he's writing to the Romans. And later on, there's writings to the Corinthians and the Ephesians and the Galatians and to the Hebrews. And he's trying to help them understand from their cultural position and their time in history yeah. 
the impact of these things on their life because when you think of the Jews and you think of their tradition and you think of their rituals, you know that there's a lot of rules and there's a lot of laws and there's these, there's these, um, basically what it means to be a Jew is to do and be all these things laid out in the Old Testament. And he's trying to help them understand what their liberty, the value of their liberty in light of being made free from sin now and free from the law. So where is our bearing in liberty? And he's, we can talk about that today, but he's trying to talk about it to them back in that time and in that context where the Hebrews have to go from being bound by their law to having the veil in the temple rent in two and having no more sacrifices offered for sins. So how do they then step into this liberty? Where is their bearing when before they had all these set of instructions? They're free from those now, and they're at liberty to, to what? Sorry, the fan keeps blowing my pages here. It says in chapter 6 and verse 10, we already read this, about Christ, that in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. And then in verse 11, it says, likewise. In the same manner, in the same way or fashion, consider yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul wasn't saying, live however you jolly well please now. He's saying, likewise, consider your state, and we're called to be holy as Christ is holy. Yeah called to be holy. How can we be holy? He says in verse 22, you have your fruit unto holiness. That is the fruit you are now at liberty to produce that you were not at liberty to produce any before because you were free from righteousness. And so he's describing to them now in context to the, in, in relation to the law, that there is now f no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. We still have time this morning, right, Aaron? Yep. We still have time this morning. So for application for us, I'd like us to look at Galatians. And Paul is writing in Galatians. He's a minister of the gospel to the Gentiles. Go to Galatians chapter 5. But I'm going to um, point out in chapter 2 that they didn't, he didn't always see eye to eye with his companion Peter, who, uh, who delivered the gospel to who? The Jews. Peter was delivering the gospel to the Jews, and Paul was delivering the gospel to the Gentiles. And he says in chapter 2, verse 7, When they saw that the gospel of uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was to Peter, he recognized that they didn't always see eye to eye. In verse, um, in verse 14, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter, and he's whole, keeping him honest here, he says to Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of the Gentiles and not as the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as the Jews? He's saying, Peter, hold on, man. You understand the freedom from the law. You're a Jew. And you're bringing the gospel to the Jews. You're bringing this gospel of freedom and this message of liberty to the Jews. And yet you're telling, and you're not living how the Jews used to live, unbound by the law. But now you're trying to tell me and the Gentiles over here that we need to live like the Jews did, even though you're not living like the Jews used to anymore. He said that he kept him honest and they're specifically discussing the, the topic of circumcision. So again, the emphasis here for us and the application we're going to take is from freedom and liberty. So flip over to Galatians 5. And I just wanted to share that from 
chapter 2 so you understand why, what's, what's compelling Paul to have this discussion with the Galatians in chapter 5. He says in verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He's also indirectly saying, I told Peter, screw his head on straight, we're not going to entangle ourselves again with this law that we've been set free from. Now, brothers, sisters, this is the good part. Verse 13, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Amen. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even the, in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, Take heed that ye be not consumed one another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So what bearing and what guideline is he now pointing to for how we exercise our liberty? He's pointing to the Spirit. He says, this is what your fruit is going to be. It's going to be fruit of righteousness unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So what are those limitations on our liberty then, if we understand it from our society's context in understanding liberty? Liberty is something we're free to, which means there's, there's things we're not, we're not free to. If we're free to something, well then that's very clearly and specifically defined. Where's our bearing? Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. 2 Corinthians 13, 3 verse 17, sorry, says, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. What he was teaching in 2 Corinthians was based on an anecdote, a short story, right, to drive home a point. And what he reminded them of, what he reminded them of was when Moses, their patriarch, went to the mountain and came back down and his face shone so brightly that he had to be covered with a veil so that their eyes would not be blinded. And he pointed out in 2 Corinthians that even though their eyes weren't blinded because Moses wore that veil, their minds were blinded. They could not understand. They weren't free. And at the time of the Corinthians, he was saying, your hearts are blind. Even though your eyes can see, like the Jews could still see because they weren't blinded by the veil of Moses, like their minds were blinded, your heart is blinded. But the Spirit of the Lord can lift the veil off of our hearts so that we can see. Amen. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, is what he says about that story. We can now see the veil is off of our hearts to now be able to see clearly and to see where our liberty lies. Back in Galatians, after he's talked about walking in the Spirit so that we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh, we get to verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, <clears throat> peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. That's Galatians 5.22. Very commonly known passage, very commonly known reference. But I want to point out to you, what is, so we know what verse 22 of Galatians 5 says. What does verse 22 of Romans 6 say? And I just lost all my, all my markers. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. The fruit of holiness is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the holiness, of unto holiness, is the fruit of the Spirit. Where the Spirit of God is, there is liberty. Don't forget verse 13 there in Galatians. Brethren, you've been called to liberty. 
only use not that liberty as an occasion to the flesh. to the flesh. I skipped over all the nasty stuff in Galatians chapter 5 and jumped to verse 22. You can read it on your own if you want. Don't use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. We aren't at liberty to that. We are only at liberty to produce holy fruit. It's interesting, we have a term, we, we, use, we use the word liberty in a way to say someone took liberties. If we take liberties, what is that, what is that indicating? Ourselves. We've stepped out of line. We've crossed the limitation, right, to take liberties. So don't forget verse 13. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. We don't want to trick ourselves into false liberty. And I think it's really interesting that the scripture points out where that occurs. In Jeremiah verse 30, uh, chapter 34 and verse 17, Therefore thus saith the Lord, You have not hearkened unto me, in proclaiming liberty every one to his brother, and every man to his neighbor. The message of freedom and liberty in America today is one of no restraint. And that's accurate for freedom. Freedom, the definition of freedom is no restraint. But that's not accurate about liberty. That's not precise about liberty. That's not true about liberty. Liberty, there is constraint with liberty. And in, and in Jeremiah, he's saying, you've not hearkened unto the Lord in proclaiming liberty every one to his brother and every man to his neighbor. You've instead taken your liberty too far. You've taken liberties. Behold, therefore, the Lord says, I proclaim a liberty for you. You want to go that far? You want to step out of bounds? I proclaim a liberty to you, to the sword, to the pestilence, and to the famine. And I'll make you to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. There's an overstepping in this nation. There's not a clear understanding or a, or a right understanding of what our liberty means. And we're talking within the four walls of our church. We're speaking about our liberty being to righteousness unto holiness with the end everlasting life. And we see our culture taking liberties and proclaiming liberty, every man to his brother saying, we're free, no restraint. But people are always looking for that bearing in their life, aren't they? People are always trying to find the value in their life and the value of their freedom and they consume it on their lusts and it's poison they're bound by sin we need to proclaim liberty everyone to his brother with a right understanding and a right perspective with a godly perspective we've been set free from sin Amen. we're alive unto God don't use our liberty as an occasion to the flesh but by love serve each other. Amen. So that is the message today. We have independence in this country. We are at liberty to serve one another. Amen. Take that to heart this morning. Amen. Aaron? Can I pray for us? Yeah. Can I take this to the Lord? Father, thank you for the chance to to discover the, the meaning of the words freedom and liberty and to recognize that we have been set free, that you have released us from the bondage of sin, that thank you, God, we are no longer free from righteousness, a terrible freedom. But Lord, knowing that we're servants either way, and God, the joy it is to be a servant to righteousness, the life we have in you, because of our liberty to righteousness, unto holiness. God, I ask that you would give us the, the wisdom, the determination, the humility to walk after the Spirit so that we don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh, that we can produce the fruit of the Spirit, 
this fruit that we're at liberty to, to share and glorify you with, to share with our communities. Lord, that you would bring conviction in the hearts of the hearts of us here at Family Worship Center, but that we would take that conviction and God, that we would take it to the streets. That we would let our light shine and our fruit unto holiness would bring you glory outside these four walls and that others would see, see the poisonous fruit of being bound to sin. That they would find bearing and value in you. In Jesus' name, amen.